how what is the security development life cycle, how to use it, um, what is the value, and where like the website, uh, where can you find the information and such on. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Nice. Well, it looks like we're already up on YouTube, even though we're not broadcasting yet to uh, Zoom. So at least we get YouTube going. Or one of those timers are good too. Yeah, we could do a timer. Sorry about the piece of the leg here, guys. I'm trying to find out where it is right now. <laughs> the web page they had last time. That was a really cool website. It was a good one. I don't remember. <laughs> Just um Hello, welcome. You can feel free to sign in and then take a seat or get comfortable. Um well I'll piece here soon. I like that scarf. We got all of our students here. <laughs> all of the people here are our students. Mm -hmm. uh, wants to install Windows feature. Remind me in three days. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing security for? Oh, I, I, I've I, been doing security I, for nine years. Nine? <laughs> nine years. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I started as a security engineer, <laughs> then I moved as a program manager, and that's pretty much what I'm being into that space, the program management space. <laughs> For a few, yeah. It oh, it's been five, six years since I started in the program management space. Oh, okay. I like it very much. Hey, where's your hubby? <laughs> he is with the doggy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He's gonna actually go grocery shopping for me. So I did a little, little lunch break today. He's gonna finish it up. So he's a wonderful man. <laughs> no, the feeling. Vacation countdown? Vacation countdown. Did I do it? Oh, 15 a.m. Huh, I did. Dang it, Steve. Oh, that looked like it. Was that it? Yeah, it was. Except it would help if I did it at 6 p.m. instead of 6 a.m. <laughs> there we go. Mm. There we go. I'm just going to go ahead and broadcast here so that we can share. I guess I can go get There we go. All right. So we're live. Oh, uh oh. Is that good? We're going to start. In 30 minutes. We try to yep. keep it good stuff when we're talking about each other. <laughs>
Are you all students? From yeah. here? Yeah. Ah, awesome. awesome. Yeah. Are you sitting as well? Yep. Oh, same class <laughs> or different class? I mean, it wouldn't, we wouldn't were know. in the same class. Oh. I have oh. one, yeah. Like, so. oh. Are you in our class right now? Yeah. Oh, what's your name? Maria. Maria? Okay, I'm Leo. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Marshall. <laughs> and you're our speaker tonight? I am the speaker tonight. Yeah. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. We're happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I pretty much I came last time on the I think it was the last session that you guys did, like the IO session. And I liked it a lot, so and I got invited to speak. So okay. excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, everybody. Yeah. So up here and cross over to that empty room with the man with the little Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, Yay. Yeah. 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 And how many weeks are um, are you in like taking classes? Have you been like uh, Thank you so second much. week? Second week? Oh, you're starting. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 All right, pizza's here, guys. Eat it all now. Thank you. Do you guys have any background in security at all? We usually play YouTube. No, so that's perfect. Then <laughs> this, is, this is the talk for you guys. Yeah. This is like 100 to 200, very introductory. So. Well, all I know about security is the lecture. So I continuously give them Okay. <laughs> 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 pizza and snacks. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of pizza, so I really like awesome. <laughs> Everyone had that. Then I just eat it all. I'll probably just go eat it all now, but. Break the pizza. Yeah, we do know your affinity for pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm just making sure, you know, everybody gets their slice to start. I mean, they I might, I might eat the whole thing. One person eats everyone else. I agree with all that I eat. Yeah. 
water. Check in on. Who are like mm-hmm. who have 
have worked in the tech yeah. industry for a long time or you have like some extensive tech knowledge, we would love I to have those. I wish they were here right now. I think this would be a great event for everybody to get to. Yeah, I, I asked Lois. She she said she couldn't make, but she had a, a biking thing she was going to do. She's always doing mountain biking, man. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, yeah. Somebody that like competitively or? I don't know if it's competitive. I do know somebody that used to do it competitively. Mm -hmm. She's really tall. She's really tall. She's got black hair. Do you bike on that trail or do you just walk it? No, I bike and burn it. Yeah? Yeah. There's one, I live up like on the north side and there's like a lot of trails up there. I was really surprised by this area and how many walking trails there are. Cause that was something like I came here from South Carolina and never had it down there. <laughs> I remember, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't have anything. Yeah, we don't care about anything like that. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna get the office and die if we have things like this. The one day I was in Arizona for training, like the first day I got there, I left my hotel at like 7 or 8 p.m. And I was like, I'm gonna walk No sense taking up the bandwidth. I walked for about like 90 seconds, and I was like, I'm just gonna die. You were brave. I don't think I was brave. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> it was like streaming sweat. I've been outside for one minute. Crazy down there. Right, cool. Cool. Well, yeah. We are on time. Let me at least point presentation. Mm -hmm. Can anyone see it right there? It's working. So, should we start? Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Let's do it. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm very happy here to be presenting. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Alex Peña. Um, and today we're going to be talking about, stay on the camera. Uh, we're going to be talking today about introduction to the security development life cycle, um, commonly known as the SDL. Um, to give you some background about myself, um, I've been in the technology space over 10 years, uh, in the information security space over eight years. Um, I started, I did a bunch of internships. My last internship was in security, and that's how I became from the developer background. I moved to the information security uh, engineer at that point. Later on, I moved to a program manager in the security space. Um, and, right, and last job I had, I was a product owner, also with security products. Um, and we are right now, right here. So pretty much, what can we expect from this talk? Um, the main idea of this talk is going to be uh, an introductory talk. So you can think about 100 to 200 level. Um, everything is going to be focused to the development team. It's not going to be focused to the to the security professional. It's more from, for anybody that is a developer, aspire to be a developer, or anybody in the developer team it can be a program manager or a tester. Um, we're going to be talking about the public classic SEO, so, and I put public classic uh, because first, uh, all the information going to be shown here is going to be available in the public. So you can go to the Microsoft SEO website and pretty much you can find everything that I'm, that I'm going to be provided here. Uh, if it's outside the SEO, at the end, I'm going to have a slide that is going to uh, uh, it's gonna show where the source is and it's going to be public again. Um, we're not going to be talking about SDR for Agile just because of the limit of time, only have one hour. Uh, but any concept that we talk here about the classic SEO, you can actually apply it to an agile methodology. And lastly, um, the third thing that we're going to keep out of scope is everything that is the, um, the OSA, that is everything related to operations, which means that we're going to be focused mostly in code, everything that is application security side. Sounds good? That's awesome. Excellent. You just need to adjust the camera a little bit. Like this way like this <laughs> thank you <You're> welcome. <laughs> so before we start talking about the SDO let's let's talk about information security what is information security um, and information security can be defined pretty simple is 
how you protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the information, of the data, right? So that is information security. Um, and what do I mean by confidentiality, integrity, and availability? So confidentiality, you can think about secrets. Secrets are kept secret, which means that you are not allowing information disclosure that anybody that is not supposed to see the data to see the data. Everything is kept secret. Uh, integrity is that nobody that is allowed to modify or tamper the data can do it. And last one is availability. It's pretty much whenever you're trying to access that information or that data, it's going to be there, right? So it's not going to be down. It's going to be available all the time. The next slide, um, I want to ask you a question. I don't know if, what do you think all these companies have in common? I don't know if anybody wants to answer. I know. You know, you know, anybody else? Of course you know. Do they take credit cards? Close. They use SDL. Close. They use SDL. Close. No. You want to answer? They've all been compromised. Yes, that's the answer. All of these have been hacked at some point. They have perhaps like really, really bad security breaches. And I selected these companies because there's an article that says that these are the 16 worst security breaches, at least recently, that have been announced. And if you see, it's very interesting because you're going to see companies like uh, Equifax that they're supposed to protect the credit card information. Uh, there. I'm yes, <laughs> yes, the financial information, which is very sensitive data. Uh, but then you lower, you see Yahoo, and Yahoo, the impact that they have is that 3 billion accounts, 3 billion accounts were compromised. Um, and then if you keep going to the lower corners, you're going to see Adult Finder, right? If somebody's an Adult Finder or it was another one that it was the website that was compromised. Ashley Madison. That is the one. Nobody wants to know that they're a member of that, right? Because people are saying like, I'm cheating or I'm having like an affair, right? Ashley Madison, for example. So that is very sensitive data. And all those different companies have been compromised at some point. So let's take an example. Let's go with, the, with Home Depot. Um, how much money do you think they lost on the, on the compromise? And to give you, um, a tip, this is not one of the top 10 listed, but it's one of the top 20. How much money do you think? Any guesses? 20 million. Higher. 50 million. Higher. 100 million? Higher. Billion. It's <laughs> lower. It's $169 million. That is the estimate that they, and that is not even in the top 10. Yes, yeah. estimated yeah. amount is $169 million. And I pretty much put the source, if you want to check, I put the source down on the article that I took that, that information. I, I know that is very, that is absolutely accurate because I know exactly who certified them and they are in very good company. Ah, okay, that's, yeah, pretty bad. Ooh. And I was John, what is the SDL, right? So the SDL is a process that pretty much allows developers to write and develop secure software and also the software to be compliance, right? So, and there's three words that I highlighted there, right? So developers, because I think this is the right audience for, for this class, uh, secure, because it's a security focus. And then the last one is compliance. And compliance is a little bit different from security. Um, and what compliance means is that there's like these different agencies, either government agencies or third party agencies that they have regulations and standards and if you want to do business with them or business in their country or write software or do anything on their country, you need to follow those standards. Those, and if you go even lower, those controls that are the, the different rules or requirements that those standards have, right? Um, a SDL is a great tool to meet compliance. If you look at many of those uh, regulations, you think about FISMA, FedRAM, HIPAA, SOC, PCI, bunch of them, that they're HIPAA, uh, I think I already mentioned it, uh, but all of them, they're going to have like some kind of controls that are very aligned with the SDL. And if you and your company know SDL, you're already knowing or complying on part of those regulations. So that's why I wanted to focus on the, on the compliance part. And if you see here the diagram, you're going to see we have about, I think it's seven different phases of the SEO that come from left to right. And this is the classic SDL. You can think that in the Agile, in the Agile world, you do things more together and align, but all these concepts are still going to be valid, just they're going to be implemented slightly different. But the concept is still the same. Let's jump to the first phase 
Uh, the first phase is the core security training. And what I want to talk about in, in, in this section is what is the importance of security training, right? First is if a development team does not take any security training, very likely they're going to write low quality code, right? And whenever they write low quality code, they're going to release a lot of vulnerabilities, which means that at the end they're going to get hacked and they're going to lose a lot of money. Um, therefore, security training is very important. But the difference between these stage and older stages is that this one you have to do it probably once a year you don't have to do it for every single project you can if you want but you can actually limit to once a year if you go by the the standards of the sdo um and my recommendation is my recommendation is start with the basics right if you want to go with training start introduction to information security introduction to the sdo uh, or something like just so you can actually get familiar with the with the content uh, and so on you have any questions yeah I mean, is this a sort of training that, like, someone like us that we could get certifications in, or? Yes. So I can actually, I'm going to, if you want, at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, okay. but I can actually talk a little bit about the different certifications that you can actually obtain in the information security space. It's not going to be SDL centric, but it's going to be related to, to the SDL under, under different um, requirements that they have. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. <clears throat> um, okay. Then once you have like uh, that basic requirement, jump in something related to the role that you have or the role that you aspire, right? And what I mean I aspire is when I, when I started, I started as a developer, but my goal was to become a program or product manager, right? So what I did is I started taking uh, anything that was related to um, uh, developer and testing and slowly started taking other uh, trainings on the program, manager, program management space. Um, and do it at least once a year. And a, a few examples is if you are a developer, a good training will be like introduction on how to write secure code. If you're a tester, it's like, or a software developer in test was how to do security testing. And then if you're a program manager or a product manager, it's like, how do we do threat modeling or like anything that is high level, right? And I'm gonna discuss some of those a little bit more in detail in the next section. The second phase is requirements. I'm pretty much the, the phase tell it itself is, what are the requirements that we're going to meet through the SDO? Um, and what I want to focus here, um, and just to pause and go back, if you see uh, the list above, is those three items, they're called uh, practices, SDO practices. Um, in, at the end, if you go to the website on the SDO, you can actually see the details on each one of those phases. Um, for this talk, I'm just going to talk and briefly touch on the overall uh, uh, phase, so we can actually cover all the phases in time. Um, so the two things that I want to, for you to, to know about this space is bug bar. And what is a bug bar? Pretty much a bug bar is pretty much a document that pretty much you create and said, okay, based on these things that I found, these vulnerabilities, these security issues, um, based on the impact that they have, um, impact, I, I can say like, okay, a good example is if I put a quote and then I show information that is uh, running back in the server, depending on the information that you're showing based on your bug bar, uh, it's going to be maybe a severity one, really bad, a critical bug. And that means that maybe when they, they click that, it shows like username, password of the connection of SQL, um, or something less simple that is just like pseudocode that doesn't matter. And that will be like a severity three. Based on that, you're going to set the, the SLA. SLA is pretty much a service level agreement. That is, when are you going to fix that, right? You can say every critical bug, I'm going to fix it in, in within five days. If it's a severity two, maybe we're gonna fix it in two weeks. And then if it's a set three, never gonna fix it, depending on however you define your bug bar, we're, I'm gonna spend one month to fix it. Does that make sense? And uh, the last one is risk assessment. And the importance of the risk assessment is, it's gonna help you focus on what are the different requirements and what are the different things that you're gonna uh, do in the future in the SDO. What does that mean? If you have an application that is a low risk, right? Let's say they have an application that, that all the information that you are actually handling in that data is public, right? You can actually go to the internet and see the exact same information. And it's not like, um, it's nothing essential. At that point, it's a, a no risk or very low risk application. And many of the other uh, requirements, you can skip them or don't do them at all, right? 
it all, but if it's a high risk, an application that is handling uh, credit card information, it's handling like um, healthcare information, it's handling like financial uh, information, then those are going to be like a higher risk application. Therefore, you want to focus more in the other requirements. Um, next step, design. And the, in the design, there's something that I think is the most important part of the design, and this threat model. And what the threat model means is pretty much a tool or a, a I don't know if I want to say a tool, but it, it's actually a tool, but you can use many tools, but it's a tool that you can actually identify all the threats. And by a threat, I mean any anything that can go wrong, right? Any possibility of something that can actually uh, be triggered by vulnerability. And a vulnerability is pretty much a weakness on the system or a weakness on the code, right? So pretty much you identify all those different threats, you list them, and pretty much you select a scheme, and based on that scheme, you pretty much categorize those threats and you work on them. And when you work on them, pretty much you say, um, let me jump to the next one. Um, I think it's easier at the end, I'm gonna actually do a, a if I have time again, I can do like a short demo so you can actually see different threats. But pretty much, um, if I simplify this, uh, you can actually use a scheme like this one's thread. It says like, okay, this thread, what does it do? It does tampering, which means that somebody can do an attack of men in the middle. Uh, let's say you have like an application and a web server. And somebody have like a sniffer or something that is pretty much intercepting that connection. And it's very easy. Anything that is not encrypted, that is not using HTTPS, that is on HTTP, anybody can actually sniff it, like take an application and read all the transactions that is going between the client side and the application. Which means that let's say that you implement um, authentication and somebody put the username and password and when you put it in the application, it submit to the server. If that one is on the clear, it's not encrypted, it's not using HTTPS, then somebody can actually use any tool and get that username and password, and pretty much you you pretty much compromise your account. They can own that account, right? So that is a threat. And how do you mitigate that threat, right? Enable HTTPS, enable SSL, enable TLS, right? Some kind of encryption on that channel that mitigate that threat, right? That threat, even if somebody now uses a tool to intercept that, since it's encrypted, they're gonna see garbage. So the threat is mitigated. And then you move to the next threat and so on. If there's a threat that you think is not high enough, you say, I'm not going to fix it, I accept the risk. And then somebody is going to sign off on that risk. Any questions so far? I pretty much put the, here the most common um, threat scheme is right. Pretty much is spoofing, tampering, the repudiation, information disclosure, uh, the of service, and elevation of privilege. Um, it's, it is the most common uh, one that I've seen use. The one that I usually use. Okay, next one. Um, the next phase is going to be the implementation phase. Uh, Premier implementation. When now we're to, when we're talking on the code, where we talk about gathering the requirements, planning, then we show us to the design where you draw the architecture of the application and you pretty much design how it's going to look, the UI, the different components. Now we're in the implementation, right? Here we're writing code. Right? We're implementing the application itself. Um, the, three, the three things that pretty much I want to focus in here is first, writing secure code. And what, and what does that mean, right? Um, there's like books and articles and everything that show you how to write secure code, right? So there's different things that you can follow, uh, such as doing like uh, input validation, um, doing avoiding doing dynamic SQL, uh, and a lot of different things that you can actually implement um, on different libraries. If you're using .NET or, or any like managed code, they're gonna have libraries that you can actually use to make sure that those applications are secure. And uh, the, the sub bullet that I put on, the, on that slide is be sure that you're not using unsafe APIs or ban um, functions. So those are functions that can easily be implemented incorrectly because it does not have any validation uh, and they are unsecure. Most of the, of the um, 
new languages and um, modern languages do not have those. Uh, I didn't say I don't want to say that out loud because I don't know if, if like every time they're going to find, like a researcher is going to find a vulnerability and there's going to be a new one that's going to be listed at some site. The other one is static code analysis. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just real quick, uh, just to let you know, you're, you're showing actually your screen on the, your screen on your laptop is actually what's appearing on the stream. So we're seeing your, your presentation view. Uh, we're seeing the presentation view. On the recordings, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no worries. Let me... I didn't want to stop you. <laughs> uh, let me see. Duplicate <clears throat> slideshow. It'll take a few seconds for this to catch up. But... <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't no, notice. Okay. Uh, let me see. Yep, that'll work. Excellent. Just for the people online. Yeah, just so the people online. Sorry for everybody online. online. Okay. Static code analysis. So, what is static code analysis? Static code analysis is whenever you have like a tool that pretty much it actually reads the code, static code, and based on that, identify different uh, security issues in the source code. Um, some of the examples are going to be FSCOP or Visual Studio, um, and those are tools that are available for free on the SDL website. If you look for them, they're going to actually show that. Um, if you go with um, premium type of tools, uh, that they're very, very advanced, and they're going to find a lot of different, more vulnerabilities across different languages, you're going to think about something like HPI 45, IBM AppScan, there's a bunch of them in the industry. And pretty much these are very, very robust tools that are going to actually look through all the different application uh, lines of code they have in your application, and they're going to find issues in that. And then instead of you testing it, uh, you pretty much review the report of what are the findings and look to see, oh, I have this bug, this bug, I need to fix it, and so on. And last one is code reviews. And code reviews are essential, especially if you're working on a team, right? Um, whenever you have projects are working with multiple people, um, you want to have somebody else especially if you're doing a change that you think is going to have any security impl implication, that look at that code and say, oh, does this look good? Or does this look like something that can be exploited, right? And if somebody else in your team or somebody that you know that is a security expert can take a look at that one, it's going to be beneficial, very beneficial because then at that point, uh, you can actually, in advance, find a vulnerability instead of waiting for, like, uh, depending on however you implemented your, your source code, to test it maybe days after whenever the bill goes and it actually compiles and you get the data. This one is gonna actually make uh, make it available much sooner. Any questions so far? Sure. Yeah. I would really like to know what exactly in the software development lifecycle would the security security fit in? Like who does it? Like is the developer along with doing the unit test and stuff? They have to make sure that they the security test for their code? Great question. So it depends on the organization, but if you follow the SDL rules, it will suppose, as you say here in, in, in this one, you're supposed to actually have, through the whole develop, software development lifecycle, different security requirements, right? And if you see this one and, and the SDLC, it's not the same, but it's very similar to different phases, right? You have requirements, design, implementation, verification, release. So. Based on that, and most organizations, the responsibility of security is in the hands of whoever is writing the code, right? Right. So that is the whoever is working part of the development team, right? Um, that being said, depending on the company that you are or that you will be, they're going to actually maybe have different roles in that company, and maybe um, there's going to be people that are going to be specialized in the security team that they're just going to look into security vulnerabilities. Okay? They're going to actually do pen testing. They're going to do static code analysis for you. Um, but um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yes, like uh, it is the developer's responsibility to follow the SDL or any other security guidance across the, the, the all the security process, right? So from the requirements, when you start the planning, on the design, you, you do threat modeling, implementation, you start looking at all these things that I'm talking about. Then on the verification, uh, you can actually go to that one and so on. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, so a similar question, piggybacking off of that, is uh, when you, is security a matter of not making mistakes in the code, or is it a matter of building additional uh, safeguards in the code? Both. Uh, 
there's this concept that is, I love it, and it's the concept of a sun bridge. And what does that mean? It means that no matter how much, how much money, resources, and things you spend trying to protect your application, which means like trying to add all those protection mechanisms and writing secure code and everything, there, there's always going to be this guy that's going to get it, right? It doesn't matter. It's, it's a mentality. Somebody's going to get it. And that's why you actually have that mentality. If somebody gets in, what's next, right? So at that point, you start thinking about like defense in depth, right? Okay, they got uh, inside the system, but how about the data? Oh, I encrypted all the data, right? So now they're not going to be able to do anything else, right? They have the second layer of defense. That's going to say, now you're going to do that. And additional to building more defense, you, you start thinking, how can I detect if somebody is inside? If you're thinking about like a huge system, let's say that you are your own like um, AWS or Azure or something like that really big, then you have to start thinking like, how can I detect if I have a hacker or somebody inside my system so I can actually know like, oh, I have a hacker. And if I detect that, how I investigate what they're doing and how I remediate take them out of the system and make sure what was the damage that was done, how I fix it, right? So you have to go like through all that methodology. I don't know if that answered your question. You have to think about everything. Uh, if you focus just on the protection and you don't have the other layers of, uh, that, um, back there, then if somebody got in, you are pretty much screwed because at that point they're going to be able to, what happened to many companies, they get hacked, the data wasn't encrypted, and now all the data is out there. If they encrypted the data, it was going to be lo uh, much less damaged. Does, yeah. that, does that answer your question? I've actually, I, I've been involved with the security breach, uh, the aftermath, the cleanup um, company I worked for actually came in after a security breach at a pretty large company. And the main problem was, is that they just didn't have proper encryption. They, they just simply weren't encrypting the data. Uh, it was just sitting there on the on the, in these text files that are on stored on hard drives and that literally like credit card information. It, it mm -hmm. seems like such a simple little, oh my goodness, but that's what companies do. And I'm talking, this is a very large one that was like a Fortune 500 company at one point that was at this stage doing this kind of thing. So it's not like uh, everybody just always thinks about these things. Yep. And that's kind of where I came up with her question is when in those situations, whose responsibility is it to, you know, like one developer just needs to not make mistakes and maybe the security person needs to know where the additional requirements go. Like whose responsibility was it to tell the team, let's encrypt that credit card data. Yeah. And that's usually it's a shared responsibility, right? <laughs> um, because if you talk with the security team, uh, the security team is going to tell you, oh, the developer is supposed to, to write secure code, right? So they're pretty much, putting the responsibility on the developer at some point. And then you talk with the developer, it's like, oh, that is a responsibility of the security team because there should test um, and detect those issues because I missed that one, right? So it's, it's a shared responsibility. It's a responsibility of everyone, if that makes sense. I don't know if, 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 if that is the answer you want to do, but each one of them has like some part in it. Um, and depending on the policy and standard of like the company, they may even be more specific and said, okay, all the data, the owner is this person, right? So it's the development team, right? They may say that and say the security team is just to help and support the, the development team, but they're not responsible for the application. They're not responsible for the data. That is the, the development team uh, responsibility, right? That may be written in some kind of like a standard or policy of the company, right? It depends on the company. That's why um, it's not like a straightforward answer. And there's different philosophies too. But overall, is I'll say that is if you ask me, it's a shared responsibility. Each one of the persons they have different responsibility, um, and the sadly, if one of them fails, the other one is supposed to cover it. But it, that is not always the case, right? Everybody's supposed to actually take security in their own hands and make sure that they're doing the right thing. So, as I understand, it's up to you to put your own encryptions in. It is uh, at, at that point. So, pretty much as a developer, and this is why. Um, you have the knowledge of writing secure code. It's like, oh, I'm working with something that is sensitive data, right? That's the mentality, right? Uh, at that point, it's, I should encrypt this, right? If you have a security team, you can actually ask for advice to the security team, like, how should I encrypt this, right? Do you have any recommended um, algorithms or any any software that is going to do or any library um, uh, that, that pretty much is going to actually cover that, right? 
And then based on that, you can actually implement those and, and make your application safe. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a, it's a, a relation between the two of them. Um, because the reality is in many companies, sadly, there's only one security guy if there's a security guy, right? Which means that he has like maybe like 20, 50 projects, how many they're running. <laughs> uh, and he can, if nobody tells anything, he's going to miss that. And he's relying on a bunch of tools and automation. And then if the tools and automation didn't catch it, then he's, he was missed. Right? Does that make sense? I don't know if that answered your question. Like the kids, like they would essentially get by. Uh, some mistakes would have got unnoticed. Or... Okay. Yeah. And sadly, most of the tools uh, are not perfect. So most of the things are not going to be cached by, by tools. So at that point, um, if you don't have like the other things that we we're talking about, they may, may be missed. So it's, uh, I, I see why you keep coming back to saying that it's the developer's responsibility, really. Yeah. Okay. It's one of those that is shared, but yeah, most of the companies put it on the development team. Uh, that I know of. Okay. Verification. So pretty much this is the next phase. And verification is you already wrote the code. How do you verify test that code, right? Um, and pretty much here, I want to focus in two, two areas, right? It's dynamic testing and fuzzing. I put the two of them together because depending on the tools, most of the tools, they provide some kind of mechanism that makes the two of them together. Um, so pretty much you can think the difference between this and the static code analysis that we talk on, on the implementation side is that these tools are going to look at compiled code, right? It's not like uh, the lines of code. It's after it compiles, it's going to start looking at the binaries, at everything that is already compiled, right? And that's why this one is different. Um, or they can actually do like dynamic testing on platforms like, uh, like let's say an example, for example, a, a web application, right? Um, you have like something like Bing.com, right? And whenever you, let's say that you are a developer on Bing and then you do a search, uh, probably like somebody in their team is gonna actually use something like uh, a web proxy, let's say like a uh, verb or, or web scan. And then pretty much based on that, uh, they can actually look at um, what are the different calls that are happening. Um, if they use something like WebScar, they can automate and start putting like a fuzzing, which means putting a bunch of data into that input parameter to see if it breaks or if it actually is able to compromise and, and find something different, right? So that usually like the concept of fuzzing is put like fuzz, like a lot of lot of data, a lot of different loads to see how the, uh, beha the application behaves. If it breaks, it actually shows a script and really do something worse. So you pretty much put a bunch of, of data over there. And last one is pen testing. Um, and pen testing is pretty much can be first party or third party, right? You can actually have a team, somebody in your team doing pen testing. You can have a security team in your company doing the pen testing, or you can hire a third party company that usually that is the most common on um, whenever you're talking on the compliance side. It's a third party company that they perform a full pen test and pretty much make sure, okay, I pen tested this and I found these vulnerabilities. They show you a report and then the, the development team see the report and they fix the things that they believe they, they should be fixed. Should be, should be. What is pen testing? Pen testing is, comes from penetration testing, which means that is the concept between white box and black box. White box is that the, the person doing the testing have access to the environment, have access to the source code, right? White, they can actually see everything. Black box is they do not have access to the environment, they don't have access to the source code, right? So they behave like a hacker, right? They're hacking the application because they don't have like that one. So pretty much at that point, they need to actually go into the system and act like a malicious user, right? And do a pen testing. Pretty much at that point, they pretty much try to imitate the hacker to pretty much try to see if they can hack the application without having the source code or information. And then if you talk about gray box, it's a mix between both, right? They can actually do like some kind, some components to black, te uh, black box testing. And then some components, they do white box testing and they can actually get the source code, right? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Last phase, well, almost last to last phase. Uh, final security review uh, is the release phase. The final security review is pretty much that phase that you look at everything that you did before, right? It's like that last checklist. 
Um, and that one you say, uh, all those security, uh, security requirements that we define in the requirement phase uh, met or not met, right? So we met them or we exceeded them or we didn't meet them, right? If we didn't, uh, do we have an exception, which means that somebody in my organization, depending on how much was the risk, uh, let's say that if it was a critical bug, maybe the vice president needs to sign off and say, ask the vice president, I'm, I'm, I feel confident that I'm going to accept the risk and going to release that high severity bug to the public, right? Does that make sense? If it's like something like less critical, maybe it's going to be like somebody that is going to be like a second level manager, uh, maybe a manager, or maybe even the, the same developer or like security team if it's a very low uh, severity, right? So it all depends on how you you manage exceptions in your organization. Um, the other one is like uh, all security bugs fixed per debug bar. And when I say per debug bar is you have that document that says, these are the type document uh, of bugs that I need to fix before I go to production, right? Let's say a good example is everything that is critical, high and medium, that is a security bug, I must fix before I release a product, right? Every, if it's low uh, or, or, or informational, non, non not aligned to any risk, those ones I can actually ship it and it doesn't matter, right? It, it, that one is gonna be defined on the bug part, that is the one that we talked before. And once you have all those, uh, you make sure that you have a security response plan in place, uh, you're good. And what is security response plan? It's pretty much it's a document. They say, what happened if things go wrong, right? Let's say, what happened if we got hacked? What happened if we find some, uh, some kind of hacker inside the system? Do we, plug all the data center and put everything down because there's somebody in there? Maybe not, maybe that is too risky. How about if we pretty much shut the user out and then we have this list of contacts that we need to call immediately. And pretty much these people are gonna actually be able to, um, let's say a blue team, that is like a security team that is there to investigate and protect the system. And they can actually take care of the, of the hacker and pretty much block the access and see how much damage the hacker did and so on, right? Um, and that is the almost last phase. The last phase is the response, which means you follow whatever the response plan says, right? If, if, some, if, the, if your system would have, you follow that document that you wrote and you make sure they execute that document. Additional to that, this is not exactly part of the SDO, uh, but I wanted to put, and it's something that is also seen for many companies on the release response, is having a bug bounty program. I don't know, is anybody here familiar with bug bounty programs? So pretty much a, a bug bounty program is pretty much different companies allows researchers and people out there, anybody pretty much can actually go and look into their application if they're <clears> customers, <throat> test the application, find vulnerabilities and bugs, submit it to that company, and then that company is gonna pay you money. I just read an article about it. Somebody uh, found out a few bucks in the Google account, and they were paid. And they were paid. Okay. As a matter of fact, a real famous incident happened with Apple iPhones. Uh, I believe it was the iPhone 6 when it was released. Uh, they had a $1 million bounty that if you could hack it, and if you could prove it, and somebody had it within like 17 hours. Uh, <laughs> Motivation. Yeah. It was, yeah, one million dollars just for figuring out the security risk. Yeah. 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 And uh, some of these companies, I put some examples here because they're like local companies on this area. Like uh, Microsoft, they have the MSRC bug bounty. AWS have their own bug bounty. Starbucks have their bug bounty. And then I listed Hacker One because it's a platform that many of the other companies, these companies, and many other companies use it uh, to pretty much like do bug bounty. So you can actually go there and you find like a bunch of different companies that are gonna pay you if you find security bugs for them. And there's some people that actually, that is their job, right? Yeah. Going through like security bugs and finding bugs, right? So like you mentioned, there's some of them that they pay, pay $1 million, $50,000, uh, $250,000 I've seen. So the, some of these pay a lot, right? Um, and there, there are other bugs that are going to pay you like maybe 100 or 500 bucks, right? So it's much lower than the other one. Um, so, but it's, it's a great thing, right? So it's a great thing for the company because they're actually getting like free, free testing or, or, or cheaper testing in some cases. Um, it also- Having a white hat hacker uh, find an exploit 
and paying them fifty thousand dollars is a heck of a lot cheaper than having all your credit card information compromised to pay one hundred sixty nine dollars million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 A lot of companies even hiring hackers. Mm -hmm their security yep. like they need to know how they do it so that can i've actually seen a lot of that recently like and helping students that i work with looking for jobs so something yeah. to think about yeah yeah, but, yeah. um i'm pretty much above and beyond what can you do above and beyond on, on the sdl so pretty much here i have like a, a gap you can become a security expert a, a security me right it's, it's a great path um, everybody's looking for people in security. Yeah, yeah. So you can see there's like a lot of money lost. So it's something that you can say, okay, I'm gonna become a developer as I did. Then I moved to security because I got a passion into security and just became a security expert. Even the different companies have like um, position inside of them that you're a developer, but you're also the security champion for the team or for the organization, which you can actually have a dual role and it's going to be at your benefit, right? Because you become essential. Your security skills become essential. Um, and you can actually help everybody. Everybody's going to love you because you're going to be able to, to do the security work that many people do not like to do. <laughs> so it's, it's a win-win. So I put evangelize. You can evangelize security, pretty much talk about security, what the, the benefits of it uh, to your teammates. Automate security testing, right? So pretty much instead of running all these tools, doing everything manually, you can actually build something for your company, for your products that pretty much run all those tools uh, and pretty much just create bugs, assign it to somebody or do some kind of automation that that one is built into the uh, into the build system, into whatever system you use uh, to, to write code and deploy code. Um, OWASP. O OWASP is a great organization and have amazing resources. They have like uh, the OWASP top 10 that are the 10 um, most uh, common or well, most risky risk uh and they have releases every few years like every two or three years i don't know exactly one and they're a great reference and they have like cheat sheets so if you want to do security testing you can look at them and you can literally and that's one of the things that i did when i started doing pen testing uh i pretty much copy and paste it from those <laughs> ones put it in the website and then modify lower to see how everything works and from there i learned slowly it's a great yeah <laughs> and then you can read security uh books and blogs i put some examples there the books that i really like um and get certified uh to your questions pretty much there a few certifications that are really really good um the, in my opinion the most important one is the one that is called cissp a certified information security system uh, professional. I think I said it correctly. Um, and pretty much that one, if you even do it, if you go to LinkedIn or Indeed or something like that, you search for that term, you can see how many job requisitions says, uh, like a preferred thing, having that, that, that certification. There are other ones like I put listed there, CEH is Certified Ethical Hacker. That one is not a rec as recognized as the CISSP, but it's a lot of fun to do it. It is fun because it's, it's, that one is more focused into tools. And the, the training book is about this. The CSSP book is about this. I'm not kidding. That is the difference between the two books to, to, to start to learn uh, one versus the other one. And it's great for the resume if you want to build the resume and have it there. And the knowledge that you get, that is even more important. The knowledge that you get is going to help you. Um, learn about, I put OSA, that I said it's out of scope, pretty much is how, instead of talking about the code and applicant, uh, like SDL is talking, this go into operation security, like how do you configure the servers, uh, the different like um, roles, active directory, and so on, right? So they have a bunch of stuff on OSA. I, I, uh, um, firewall, I, I, I don't even remember how many things, they have a bunch of them listed. Uh, you can actually go to network infrastructure security, I pretty much, Keep up to date on what is happening on the news on security. That one is also good to, to have. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, and I, as I mentioned, at least right there, the old top 10 that are the top 10 uh, that we have right now. And it's something interesting to, to take a look at and the resources that I use. Any questions so far? So you have mentioned like at the beginning that you recommend the first thing is to do security training every year. So would that usually be like the same security training every year? Like if 
great what question. Would it be like a different. That is a great question. You want to do something different. Okay. Um, the reality is, and I said uh, every year, just because that is like the minimum bar that is recommended, right? Um, if you talk with some teams, they do it like every quarter or like every six months and so on. Um, and some people, they do two every year. They said, okay, we're going to do one training on operational side and one training in application security side, for example, right? Um, and the main reason why I say once a year is a, a policy, but you, what you want to do is pretty much build your knowledge, right? So let's say you talk like, in, like introduction to security and you say, oh, they start talking about pen testing. They start talking about infrastructure security. They start talking about application security. They start talking about uh, risk management. They start talking about something that I have mentioned before, privacy, right? I said like, oh, in that one, that one of privacy sounds very interesting. My next training is gonna be something related to privacy, right? And then you jump into that space or maybe it's like, oh, I remember that project that I had. Um, and now that I saw this training, I wrote a security book in there. And I didn't know at that point because I didn't take the training. I should know, I should learn more about how to write more secure code, maybe at that point on C-sharp, right? Well, what are the vulnerabilities that are having on, on JavaScript, right? How can I write more secure code in JavaScript? And with that mentality, you can actually keep learning, right? Domain idea is like something that interested you, right? If, if, if it's boring, you're not gonna do it, right? That's how, I, like whenever I find something that I find exciting, even if it's not very related of what I do, I, I, I try to take that training. Just because um, my personality is more about like what I love to do, I, I usually do it more often. And then I can actually, instead of doing one, I ended up doing like three or four different trends just because I do it. Um, so my recommendation is find something that like some space right there that you like and jump into it. Um, I have a question. Uh, um, actually, I came to ask this question to another person today, but I couldn't get a good answer and I didn't Google it either. So I thought maybe why not ask you. Uh, if, imagine if I'm having a website and I'm a photographer. And I want to secure all the photographs that I'm taking. What's the best way to do it? If you are a photographer mm -hmm. and you have, do you have your own website or are you seeing a third party website? Um, no, I'm talking about my website. Your website? Mm -hmm. um, if you're building your own website and you're using, um, you are storing photography. Um, or be it anything. I just want to know. I just Google for a few pages and Google can filter the images which are, you know, not allowed to be copied because of privacy violations. How exactly does that work? Like, how, how can I make sure that nobody takes my images from my website and I have? Okay, that, that, that is a great question. If you ask me the easiest way, and probably there's a better way, and I don't know if this one's correct, there's a file called robot.txt, right? That file pretty much it, it pretty much says to the different crawlers and website, you cannot look into this file, right? So if whenever Google, Bing, or any other search website look into your website, it looks at that file, the robot.txt, and says, oh, I cannot look into the file that says images. Therefore, I cannot look there, so I'm not gonna look. I'm gonna look at the rest of the website. So whenever I do the Chrome, it's not gonna look at that website. So if you define the robot.txt that everything below images is not allowed for the quarter to look into it, then they're not supposed to, to do it. Well, and they still can, right? They're just not supposed to. They're not supposed to. Yeah, that the is crawlers right. aren't going to go in there. But yeah, I'm trying to see like the yeah. at least it's going to solve. I think your concern that you have right now on like anybody yeah, looking at exactly images. I'm exactly not very sure how, how I'm going to implement the robot.txt file, but yes, that's a good way to start. Yeah, yeah. that uh, for me is like the easiest way. I usually try to go with the easiest. This is not the right solution. You can actually try so something more advanced. When you actually create an image tag, you have an option to keep it hidden, invisible, privacy stuff, something like that. I am not very you know, pro in HTML, but I'm just curious. I'd say actually probably one of your better strategies is anything that you put publicly up on your page, put a watermark on it. That's what I was going to say. I was yeah. actually a photography major. Yeah. Oh. And yeah, they'll tell you that anything you put online that is your material, you should put a watermark on it. Yeah, that way, if anybody does get it, it's going to show your information on it. And then in that case, it's actually free advertising. And the way that you do that, it's very, very easy. All you have to do is import the image into Photoshop and add a new layer and put like a transparent watermark, like your name or whatever, in that layer. 
and that then if you want to recreate that image, then you just have to save it as a file without that additional layer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's my, it's my hardest <laughs> knowledge. Yeah. And it's really helpful because even if somebody does come and steal your image, I mean, all they're doing is they're just advertising for you. Yeah. Now your name is right there on the yeah. image. It's hard to edit out a lot of hard. Yeah. So I just wanted to know, you know, I Another strategy for handling something like that is actually you store it in a database itself as basically what we call a blob. So that uh, instead of just directly having those files accessible through the hard drive, somebody has to make some sort of query through the database to go get that information. And you can even go so far as to encrypt that in your database. Yeah. So that's, that's something you can do. It bloats the database of doing that. So unless you use file streaming, but that's a whole other. But yeah, you can basically store it as a database instead of just the actual image on the hard disk. You're also going to need JavaScript to disable the uh, browser control so people can't just like right cl click and download this oh, file. Oh, yeah. That's another thing. I was just thinking about how, what's the easiest way that, that I would uh, you know, think about. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Like, this one. is deep, whatever inputs you guys give is deep, but this is probably Yeah, that's a simple one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can copy and paste that. <laughs> that's just one route to get them. There are other routes too. Like yeah. you, if they yeah. if they put in the direct URL, they can get it that way too, unless you like reroute the direct URL. So you know there are always different avenues to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep in mind that anything that you do on the client side, like JavaScript, mm -hmm. it can be easily bypassed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so. That's true. Yeah. From security uh, person, yeah. So if he's, if you want to keep like the majority of people, that would be great. But if he's if he's something that you really do want to keep, uh, then that is the next level. You have to start thinking about how to do it on the server side. So the client side. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'll throw out a question. Um, a yeah. Bit more in the weeds. Can you? I don't know if this is since you're a security expert. Maybe you can throw this one out there. Uh, but I wouldn't fault you if you don't. What is the difference between TLS 1.2 and 1.3? There was a vulnerability with 1.2 that was patched over in 1.3. Can you like maybe twist? explain <laughs> what the vulnerability was? Maybe? I don't remember the vulnerability. Oh, okay. no, there right. you got me there. You know, yeah. So maybe, was, maybe you could give a little insight into what it is that you do. But I, 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 yeah, I can actually go back to you to see what was the vulnerability there. Okay. But I, yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I know they came up with a new, like 1.3 TLS is now uh, required for any banking transactions, that sort of thing. So, that makes sense. Yeah, pretty much everything that is like uh, SSL1, SSL2, yeah. like, they slowly yeah. go deprecating those algorithms. Yeah. Just because they have been finding like, more involved in what it is. It's, it's going to keep happening. Yeah. Hackers are smart. It's like something that you're going to know is like anything that is in this, like, developers and, and, in, and security people, we have limited amount of time, right? We have like, it's our job, we have eight, eight hours a day to do like a lot of stuff. Some of these hackers, they actually have like companies and organizations. They actually have benefits to pretty much like send spam, um, send like a lot of stuff. There's a great book called, well, let me see, if, Spam Nation, I think is the name of the book. I don't know if you, anybody have read it. Is it, by, it was written by like the second Leading spam, kind of like, and then he just yes, quit. yes, like he quit. He said, "I'm done." I'm, I'm. It's, I think, he is uh, Krebs. Krebs is the guy. Yeah. He pretty much is a um, a a news guy, is pretty much that pretty much is specialized in security, and he went into like the big guys of that did like spam, phishing, and all the pharmaceuticals. You know, like all those emails that you get of like Viagra and all that those stuff. <laughs> Pretty much, he got into like uh, those stories on how they actually have organizations, benefits, and everything. So it's it's very good, like uh, interesting book to read. Any other questions? Um, I'll just say probably one of the best things you could possibly do right up front is make sure your website is doing HTTPS instead of HTTP. Yeah, you definitely want to switch over to HTTPS at, with if at all possible. There's free. Uh, there's free certificates that you can get now for authenticating and verifying your site as an HTTPS application, and you should absolutely do it because it, it does what we call encryption on the wire. The communication between your browser and my server is encrypted, and nobody can 
wedge themselves in between to monitor that connection because it's an encrypted connection. If you just do open in the air HTTP, it's just text. Somebody can jump in there and actually see the free text. So usernames, passwords, that sort of thing. Um, something just to follow on that question. I mentioned Thremoling. So this is the thread, the Thremoling tool that Microsoft provides for free. So you can actually download it and do your Threm models. So pretty much in here, you can find something like that, like you just mentioned, right? You usually start with a high-level architecture. In this case, I have like a browser, a web application, and a SQL database, right? So like very high level. And then from there, you can actually throw like, this is the trust bundle, right? So inside here is my data center. Here's the internet, so I don't trust whatever is happening out there. Um, and once you build something like that, uh, you go here to view, and you go to the analysis view, and if you see, it's gonna show me all the different threads. And it's good, this is completely generated automatically by the system, which is great. So you can actually have like all the different threads. And if this is HTTP, it can be encrypted. Um, and then if you go, let me see if I double click, if it goes bigger. Yeah. So you have like all the details on it. And then it's a priority. Uh, the category is using, using Stripe, as I mentioned before, it's tampering. So somebody can modify the data. Um, and so on. So this is a great tool to use to do those. And pretty much at the end, what you want to do is make sure that everything is not applicable or mitigated, right? So you want to make sure that all every single threat is not applicable or mitigated. Um, at that point, you you address all the different risks on the application. So that is this is a great tool. I love it. So in case that you want to at some point play with like how to do design reviews and everything, um, this is a great tool. The other benefit is if you don't have like a, one of those tools. This one, you just to copy and paste to this diagram, you paste it in the document, you have already like a high level architecture diagram. Um, not Excel perfect, but it's something that you can actually use it for documentation. To get a general idea of how you should, what if you architect your application in this particular way, here are the vulnerabilities that you have to make sure you're accounting for, is what it says. Yes, yes. It's gonna say all the different risks like if you see like potential lack of input validation for web application, pretty much here it's gonna say like the description of what the attacker can do with that risk, right? This I mean, is free, right? And this is completely free. It's, it's a great tool, it's completely free. Um, and I love it. It's my go-to, whenever I have to do a thermal, I do this and whenever I need to review a thermal, I should recommend this tool because it's, it makes the, my life and the guy, uh, the, the whoever's doing the, the thermal easier because everything is auto generated. They don't have to feel like, well, not everything, but most of the information is auto generated. So they don't have to think about that. And furthermore, if the, it actually is great because we have like the different <coughs> technology specific. So you can actually use like web application, a human users. You can actually go like SQL database versus cloud storage. Each one of them have different risks and different threats. So it's going to be even more specific to that technology that you have. Yeah, that's very much it. Any other questions? I actually missed the yeah. first part when you loaded the tool for the threat modeling. Yeah. So what, how exactly do you get the code in uh, to for threat modeling? For, for threat modeling, threat modeling is before you start coding. So pretty much is whenever you envision the design and architecture of the, of the solution you're doing, right? So it's whenever you start, like whenever you have like a new application, you say, Oh, ambition that I think I'm gonna have like a web application. And I need some kind of storage to store like all the photos or store like all the data that I'm having for like uh, my friends, right? So and then you start drawing, oh, I have like a web application here. Then I have here, like, am I gonna have a, web, a mobile device that is gonna access that? Or I'm gonna have like a web application. And then you start like the, the, the mobile device or the web application or anything else here. And then in the back end, I have different storage. Am I gonna use like a a hosted SQL server that I own, or I'm gonna use like something uh, from AWS or Azure or any other cloud provider that pretty much provided, provided me like something like um, uh, DynamoDB or DocumentDB that is non-SQL versus something that is SQL or a blob storage, right? And that's when you start drawing in a whiteboard uh, or in a document. So you can actually use this tool to start drawing like how everything's gonna look. Uh, let's say that you use like a third party component like I'm going to use Facebook for authentication. Then you put like another component right here that is Facebook. And you start listing like the different things. And at the end, it's like, oh, this is how my application is going to look at. 
And then after you have that design, you start working on the code and the implementation itself. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. it, it does make a lot of sense yeah. now because I didn't actually get the idea of what exactly. Yeah, it's a that session of whiteboarding and it's great for discussions. Um, so for me, the three model tool, the best thing is the conversations that you have it. Even if it's not very robust, even if it's not very complex, just having that exercise, you're gonna have like the whole team talking about security. So they are gonna actually start challenging the product itself and they're gonna start challenging their decisions that they're gonna make. And that is usually the ideal way. In many cases, they do the thermal at the end. So they start challenging everything that they did. Um, that one is more complicated because some of my reviews that I've done, and many people can actually tell you, if you find a bug in the thermal review, once everything is done, it's super costly to fix it. Very, very costly, many issues, because some of them are going to actually, you need to change the architecture in some cases. You need maybe to actually change the technology, right? So maybe you need to re-enable, start, now you, to, you need to start talking about SSL. Oh, I need to buy a certificate. I need to, so there's a lot of things that you've, if you do it at the end, it's, at the end, it's going to be more costly. So ideally, you want to do it as early as possible, design or start implementation. Phase. So would you suggest this be part of a retro? That is, I will suggest, I will suggest that maybe do it a standalone before everything, right? So whenever you do uh, that first design phase uh, okay. that you have and you're building the planning phase, the yeah. planning phase yeah. or the bad luck, you right. can actually do it right there. Yeah. But if retro will, will also work, depending on how long are your sprints, right? If you yeah. have like very long sprints, I already like did a lot of it, then you can have that problem that you have maybe four weeks and you found like something that it should have been done in the first week. Does that make sense? Then that one is gonna actually affect the, the, um, the impact. So if you have one or two week sprints, I'm with you. Like, yeah, that would be a great place to do it. Um, yeah. Another question. So one way to uh, do security in the development is threat modeling. Once you have the code, you can still validate and you check. You can check. You said you have tools to check if it's secure. Yes. How long does the process take? Like, is uh, if the code needs to get built before it gets checked, right? So that is a great how, question. How friendly is the tool? Like, are you talking about like the whole process end to end, like the, or are you talking about just thread modeling? No, uh, I'm not talking about thread modeling. I'm talking about once you have the code in hand. If I'm a developer, yeah. I want to get my code checked, and you have tools to do it. Yep. How easy is it? Is it? Great, great question. It it depends on the maturity of your company. Um, let me step back. If you have like a very large company, uh, big names you can think about Microsoft, so on, right? So the AWS, like they're gonna have like already automated those tools, right? So in that case, you don't even know that security is happening, right? Whenever you checking something in the build, they run all the tools. Or before you 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 do anything on the build, the same tool is going to run some something that is going to pop you and say, "Oh, you have this bug here, right?" So companies that are, that are large and have automated everything, you're not going to you're going to the only problem you're going to have is they need to fix the bug. So you're going to spend time, but it's fixing the bug, not running the tools or interpreting and um, creating bugs. That being said. If you have your own shop, right? Let's say that I'm my own developer, I don't have no automation, then it's gonna be costly, right? Because at that point, I need to spend some time running the tools. So that depending on how large is my solution, it may be 15 minutes, then I need to go through the reports, then I need to look for the bugs. And it also depends on the tools that you're running. Some of them are really user-friendly. Other ones are very, very noisy. They're gonna give you a lot of false positives. And at the beginning, it's painful. It's very, very painful because you have a lot of things that they look like they're important, but they're crap. Um, and then you have to actually get smarter and say, oh, this really doesn't matter. Why? Because I'm not using this type of technology. Therefore, this does not apply to my, to my code. But next time, that one is not going to show up again. Or even if it's show up, you just ignore it because you know that that doesn't matter. Does that make sense? So pretty much you, you tone yourself. Um, and depending on the tools that you have available, it's going to take X amount of time. Um, the more you do it, the faster you get at it. 
the, and the more frequently you run it, the faster you identify the bugs and the less, the, the, the worst problem may be if you run everything at the end. Then it's like chaos because you found all these issues. Uh, maybe some of these are going to be very costly to fix. Um, and as I mentioned, maybe some of them are even like technology issues. Uh, you can think about maybe you shows, let's use a stream case. It shows a database technology that is not compliant with the company that you're using, right? So let's say that you use this technology and your customer was a, a health provider and this third party database is not HIPAA compliant, which means you need to switch everything. If you didn't code everything as you're supposed to, if you did like these shortcuts and you hard coded more of the thing, then you need to go back and change everything to change to like something that is compliant with that requirement that you had, right? So that one's gonna get really, really costly. Um, and in that case, since I mentioned it's compliance, it's regulation, it's not like, ah, maybe I skip it. At that point, you need to fix it because either you're gonna get like a huge fee. Um, at the same time, it's not the right thing to do, right? Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but it, it depends. Um, I'll say like, uh, you can, and you slowly can actually make uh, estimates of how much it takes, right? A good example is, it usually takes me about two hours to do a thermal, right? Uh, maybe uh, one hour to review it with, with my team. So that is three hour for modeling. Uh, it takes me about uh, two hours to do the static code analysis for a simple application. That has, so I have like five hours. It takes me about three hours to fix the bugs and review those analysis. Same way with, with analysis. At the end, you said, oh, my whole security life cycle, it took me about 15 hours of additional work that I didn't plan um, if I wasn't doing security, right? So. I'm, I'm giving you random numbers depending on the size of the application and when do you do it, those numbers are going to vary. Yeah. I don't know, probably it's not the best answer, but it's no, like it. It does do. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we're good. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your current students, but if anyone is not, just so you all know, we do have a cybersecurity program coming in January. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be available yes. soon. Yes. Um, other than currently, we offer software development or data science programs. Awesome. Those are great news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was. I actually just got that news today. So yeah. I was like, yeah. 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 yeah, it was convenient. If you have not already eaten pizza, please do. We have a lot. We have so much. <laughs> I'm going to read some pizza. We have a lot of pizza. Do you want to uh, stop the broadcast? I might. Yeah, we'll need to do this. Thanks, here everybody, tomorrow, for watching. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, okay. Woohoo. <laughs> right. that, that pizza lunch we've been wanting to have? Yeah. There it is. It came to us. <laughs> I'll leave one for you. Rather convenient. <laughs>